Miss Cass, what happened in chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest? Um, they, so Harry and Hermione and Ron and Hagrid, they went into the Forbidden Forest and then they, then like they kind of split up and then they switched places whenever they split up and then Harry saw um, Voldemort drinking the blood of a unicorn because he needed it to live but his life would be cursed then. Very good Cass. All right. Are you ready to finish Harry Potter? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I can't, I'm ready to see your reaction when we get to the part that I know you're going to freak out. All right. Here we go. Do you have your book? Yeah. Okay. Chapter 16 Through the Trap Door. In years to come, Harry would never quite remember how he had managed to get through his exams when he half expected Voldemort to come bursting through the door at any moment. Yet the days crept by and there could be no doubt that Fluffy was still alive and well behind the locked door. It was swelteringly hot, especially in the large classroom where they did their written papers. They had been given special new quills for the exams, which had been bewitched with an anti-cheating spell. They had practical exams as well. Professor Flitwick called them one by one into his class to see if they could make a pineapple tap dance across the desk. Professor McGonagall watched them turn a mouse into a snuff box. Points were given for how pretty the snuff box was, but taken away if it had whiskers. Snape made them all nervous, breathing down their necks while they tried to remember how to make a forgetfulness potion. Harry did the best he could, trying to ignore the stabbing pains in his forehead, which had been bothering him ever since his trip into the forest. Neville thought Harry had a bad case of exam nerves because Harry couldn't sleep, but the truth was that Harry had kept being woken by his old nightmare, except that it was worse now than ever because there was a hooded figure dripping blood in it. Maybe it was because they hadn't seen what Harry had seen in the forest, or because they didn't have scars burning on their foreheads. But Ron and Hermione didn't seem as worried about the stone as Harry. The idea of Voldemort certainly scared them, but he didn't keep visiting them in dreams, and they were so busy with their revision, they didn't have much time to fret about Snape or anyone else might be up to. <clears throat> their very last exam was History of Magic, one hour of answering questions about batty old wizards who'd invented self-stirring cauldrons and they'd be free free for a whole wonderful week until their exam results came out. When the ghost of Professor Binns told them to put down their quills and roll up their parchment, Harry couldn't help cheering with the rest. That was far easier than I thought it would be, said Hermione, as they joined the crowds flocking out into the sunny grounds. I needn't have learnt about the 1637 werewolf code of conduct or the uprising of Elfric the Eager. Hermione always liked to go through their exam papers afterwards, but Ron said this made him feel ill, so they wandered down to the lake and flopped under a tree. The Weasley twins and Lee Jordan were tickling the tentacles of a giant squid, which was basking in the warm shallows. No more revision, Ron sighed happily, stretching out on the grass. You could look more cheerful, Harry. We've got a week before we find out how badly we've done. There's no need to worry yet. Harry was rubbing his forehead. I wish I knew what this means, he burst out angrily. My scar keeps hurting. It's happened before, but never as often as this. Go to Madame Pomfrey, Hermione suggested. I'm not ill, said Harry. I think it's a warning. It means danger's coming. Ron couldn't get worked up. It was too hot. Harry, relax. Hermione's right. The stone's safe as long as Dumbledore's around. Anyway, We've never had any proof Snape found out how to get past Fluffy. He, he nearly had his leg ripped off once. He's not about to try it again in a hurry, and never will play Quidditch for England before Hagrid lets Dumbledore down. 
Harry nodded, but he couldn't shake off a lurking feeling that there was something he'd forgotten to do, something important. When he tried to explain this, Hermione said, that's just the exams. I woke up last night and was halfway through my transfiguration notes before I remembered we'd done that one. Harry was quite sure the unsettled feeling didn't have anything to do with work though. He watched an owl flying towards the sky across the blue, across the bright blue sky, a note clamped in its mouth. Hagrid was the only one who ever sent him letters. Hagrid would never betray Dumbledore. Hagrid would never tell anyone how to get past Fluffy. Never, but Harry suddenly jumped to his feet. Where are you going? said Ron sleepily. I just thought of something, said Harry. He had gone white. We've got to go and see Hagrid now. Why? panted Hermione, hurrying to keep up. Don't you think it's a bit odd, said Harry, scrambling up the grassy slope, that what Hagrid wants more than anything else is a dragon, and a stranger turns up who just happens to have an egg in his pocket. How many people wander around with dragon eggs if it's against wizard law? Lucky they found Hagrid, don't you think? Why didn't I see it before? What are you on about, said Ron, but Harry sprinting across the grounds towards the forest didn't answer. Hagrid was sitting in an armchair outside his house. His trousers and sleeves were rolled up and he was shelling peas into a large bowl. Hello, he said, smiling. Finished your exams? Got time for a drink? Yes, please, said Ron, but Harry cut across him. No, we're in a hurry, Hagrid. I've got to ask you something. You know that night you won Norbert? What did the stranger you were playing cards with look like? Don't know, said Hagrid casually. He wouldn't take his cloak off. He saw the three of them look stunned and read his eyebrows. It's not that unusual. You get a lot of funny folk in the hogshead. That's one of the pubs down in the village. Might have been a dragon dealer, mightn't he? I never saw his face. He kept his hood up. Harry sank down next to the bowl of peas. What? What did you want to talk about, Hagrid? Did you mention Hogwarts at all? Might have come up, said Hagrid, frowning as he tried to remember. Yeah, he asked what I did, and I told him I was a gamekeeper here. He asked a bit about the sort of creatures I look after, so I told him, and I said what I'd always really wanted was a dragon, and then, I can't remember too well, because he kept buying me drinks. Let's see. Yeah, then he said he had the dragon egg, and we could play cards for it if I wanted, but he had to be sure I could handle it. He didn't want it to go to any old home, so I told him about Fluffy. A dragon would be easy. And did he did he seem interested in Fluffy? Harry asked, trying to keep his voice calm. Well, yeah, how many free-headed dogs do you meet, even around Hogwarts? So I told him, Fluffy's a piece of cake if you know how to calm him down. Just play him a bit of music and he'll go straight off to sleep. Hagrid suddenly looked horrified. I shouldn't have told you that, he blurted out. Forget I said it. Hey, where are you going? Harry, Ron, and Hermione didn't speak to each other at all until they came to a halt in the entrance hall, which seemed very cold and gloomy after the grounds. We've got to go to Dumbledore, said Harry. Hagrid told that stranger how to get past Fluffy, and it was either Snape or Voldemort under that cloak. It must have been easy once he'd gotten Hagrid drunk. I just hope Dumbledore believes us. Marines might back us up if Bane doesn't stop him. Where's Dumbledore's office? They looked around as if hoping to see a sign pointing them in the right direction. They had never been told where Dumbledore lived, nor did they know how, know anyone who had been sent to see him. We'll just have to, Harry began, but a voice suddenly rang across the hall. What are you three doing inside? It was Professor McGonagall carrying a large pile of books. We want to see Professor Dumbledore, said Hermione rather bravely. Harry and Ron thought, See, Professor Dumbledore, Professor McGonagall repeated, as though this was a very fishy thing to want to do. Why? Harry swallowed. Now what? It's sort of a secret, he said, but he wished at once he hadn't, because Professor McGonagall's nostrils flared. Professor Dumbledore left ten minutes ago, she said coldly. He received an urgent owl from the Ministry of Magic and flew off from London at once. He's gone, said Harry frantically. Now? Professor Dumbledore is a very great wizard, Potter. He has many demands on his time, but this is important. Something you have to say is more important than the Ministry of Magic, Potter. Look, said Harry, throwing caution to the winds. Professor, it's about the Sorcerer's Stone. 
Whatever Professor McGonagall had expected, it wasn't that. The books she was carrying tumbled out of her arms, but she didn't pick them up. How do you know, she spluttered. Professor, I think, I know that, that someone's trying to instill the stone. I've got to talk to Professor Dumbledore. She eyed him with a mixture of shock and suspicion. Professor Dumbledore will be back tomorrow, she said finally. I don't know how you found out about the stone, but rest assured, no one can possibly steal it. It's too well protected. But Professor Potter, I know what I'm talking about, she said shortly. She bent down and gathered up the fallen books. I suggest you all go back outside and enjoy the sunshine. But they didn't. It's tonight, said Harry, once he was sure Professor McGonagall was out of earshot. Snape's going through the trap door tonight. He's found out everything he needs, and now he's got Dumbledore out of the way. He sent that note. I bet the Ministry of Magic will get a real shock when Dumbledore turns up. But what can we? Hermione gasped. Harry and Ron wheeled around. Snape was standing there. Good afternoon, he said smoothly. They stared at him. You shouldn't be inside on a day like this, he said with an odd twisted smile. We were, Harry began without any idea what he was going to say. You want to be more careful, said Snape. Hanging around like this, people will think you're up to something and Gryffindor really can't afford to lose any more points, can they? Harry flushed. They turned to go back outside, but Snape called them back. Be warned, Potter. Any more nighttime wanderings, and I will personally make sure you are expelled. Good day to you. He strode off in the direction of the staff room. Out on the stone steps, Harry turned to the others. Right, here's what we've got to do, he whispered urgently. One of us has got to keep an eye on Snape. Wait outside the staff room and follow him if he leaves it. Hermione, you'd better do that. Why me? It's obvious, said Ron. You can pretend to be waiting for Professor Flitwick, you know. He put on a high voice. Oh, Professor Flitwick, I'm so worried. I think I got question 14B wrong. Oh, shut up, said Hermione, but she agreed to go and watch out for Snape. And we better stay outside the third floor corridor, Harry told Ron. Come on. But that part of the plan didn't work. No sooner had they reached a door separating Fluffy from the rest of the school than Professor McGonagall turned up again, and this time she lost her temper. I suppose you think you're harder to get past than a pack of enchantments, she stormed. Enough of this nonsense. If I hear you've come anywhere near here again, I'll take another 50 points from Gryffindor. Yes, Weasley, from my own house. Harry and Ron went back to the common room. Harry had just said, at least Hermione's on Snape's tail, when the portrait of the fat lady swung open and Hermione came in. I'm sorry, Harry, she wailed. Snape came out and asked me what I was doing, so I said I was waiting for Flitwick, and Snape went to get him, and I've only just got away. I don't know where Snape went. Well, that's it then, isn't it, Harry said. The other two stared at him. He was pale and his eyes were glittering. I'm going out of, getting out of here tonight, and I'm going to try and get to the stone first. You're mad, said Hermione. You can't, said, you're mad, said Ron. You can't, said Hermione. After what McGonagall and Snape have said, you'll be expelled. So what, Harry shouted. Don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of the stone, Voldemort's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for the dark arts. Losing points doesn't matter anymore, can't you see? Do you know, think he'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins the House Cup? If I get caught before I get to the stone, well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Baltimore to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have done because I'm never going over to the dark side. I'm going through that trap door tonight and nothing you two say is going to stop me. Baltimore killed my parents, remember? He glared at them. You're right, Harry, said Hermione in a small voice. I'll use the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It's just lucky I got it back. But will it cover all three of us, said Ron. All, all three of us? Oh, come off it. You don't think we'd let you go alone? Of course not, said Hermione briskly. How do you think you'd get to the stone without us? I'd better go and look through my books. There might be something useful. <coughs> but if we get caught, you two will be expelled too. Not if I can help it, said Hermione grimly. 
Flitwick told me in secret that I got 112% on his exam. They're not throwing me out after that. After dinner, the three of them sat nervously apart in the common room. Nobody bothered them. None of the Gryffindors had anything to say to Harry anymore after all. This was the first night he hadn't been upset by it. Hermione was skimming through all her notes, hoping to come across one of the enchantments they were about to try and break. Harry and Ron didn't talk much. Both of them were thinking about what they were about to do. Slowly, the room emptied as people drifted off to bed. Better get the cloak, Ron muttered as Lee Jordan finally left, stretching and yawning. Harry ran upstairs to their dark dormitory. He pulled out the cloak and then his eyes fell on the flute Hagrid had given him for Christmas. He pocketed it to use on Fluffy. He didn't feel much like singing. He ran back down to the common room. We'd better put the cloak on here and make sure it covers all three of us. If Filch spots one of our feet wandering along on its own. What are you doing? Said a voice from the corner of the room. Neville appeared from behind an armchair, clutching Trevor the Toad, who looked as though he'd been making another bid for freedom. Nothing, Neville, nothing, said Harry, hurriedly putting the cloak behind his back. Neville stared at their guilty faces. You're going out again, he said. No, 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 said Hermione. No, we're not. Why don't you go to bed, Neville? Harry looked at the grandfather clock by the door. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. Snape might even now be playing Fluffy to sleep. You can't go out, said Neville. You'll be caught again. Gryffindor will be in even more trouble. You don't understand, said Harry. This is important. But Neville was clearly stealing himself to do something desperate. I won't let you do it, he said, hurrying to stand in front of the portrait hole. I'll, I'll fight you. Neville, Ron exploded. Get away from that hole and don't be an idiot. Don't you call me an idiot, said Neville. I don't think you should be breaking any more rules. And you were the one who told me to stand up to people. Yes, but not to us, said Ron in exasperation. Neville, you don't know what you're doing. He took a step forward and Neville dropped Trevor the Toad, who left out of sight. Go on then, try and hit me, said Neville, raising his fists. I'm ready. Harry turned to Hermione. Do something, he said desperately. Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she said, I'm really, really sorry about this. She raised her wand. Petrific totalus, she cried, pointing it at Neville. Neville's arms snapped to his sides. His legs sprang together, his whole body rigid. He squared, swayed where he stood and then fell flat on his face, stiff as a board. Hermione ran to turn him over. Neville's jaws were jammed together so he couldn't speak. Only his eyes were moving, looking at them in horror. What have you done to him, Harry whispered. It's the full body bind, said Hermione miserable, miserably. Oh, Neville, I'm so sorry. We had to, Neville. No time to explain, said Harry. You'll understand later, Neville, said Ron, as they stepped over him and pulled out the invisibility cloak. But leaving Neville lying motionless on the floor didn't feel like a very good omen. In their nervous state, every statue's shadow looked like Filch. Every distant breath of wind sounded like peas swooping down on them. At the foot of the first set of stairs, they spotted Mrs. Norris skulking near the top. Oh, let's kick her just this once, Ron whispered in Harry's ear, but Harry shook his head. As they climbed carefully around her, Mrs. Norris turned her lamp-like eyes on them, but didn't do anything. They didn't meet anyone else until they reached the staircase up to the third floor. Pease was bobbing halfway up, loosening the carpet so that people would trip. Who's there, he said suddenly as they climbed towards him. He narrowed his wicked black eyes. No, you're there even if I can't see you. Are you ghoulie or ghosty or we student beastie? He rose up in the air and floated there, squinting at them. Should call Filch, I should, if something's a creeping around unseen. Harry had a sudden idea. Peeves, he said in a hoarse whisper. The bloody Baron has his own reasons for being invisible. Peeves almost fell out of the air in shock. He caught himself in time and hovered about a foot off the stairs. So sorry, your bloodiness, Mr. Baron, sir, he said greasily. My mistake, my mistake, I didn't see you. Of course I didn't, you're invisible. Forgive me, old Peasy, his little joke, sir. I have business here, Peeves, croaked Harry. Stay away from this place tonight. 
I will, sir. I most certainly will, said Pease, rising up in the air again. Hope your business goes well, Baron. I'll not bother you. And he scooted off. Brilliant, Harry whispered Ron. A few seconds later, they were there outside the third floor corridor, and the door was already ajar. Well, there you are, Harry said quietly. Snape's already got past Fluffy. Seeing the open door somehow seemed to impress upon all three of them what was facing them. Underneath the cloak, Harry turned to the other two. If you want to go back, I won't blame you. He said, you can take the cloak. I won't need it now. Don't be stupid, said Ron. We're coming, said Hermione. Harry pushed the door open. As the door creaked, low rumbling growls met their ears. All three of the dog's noses sniffed madly in their direction, even though it couldn't see them. What's that at its feet, Hermione whispered. Looks like a harp, said Ron. Snape must have left it there. It must wake up the moment you stop playing, said Harry. Well, here goes. He put Hagrid's flute to his lips and blew. It wasn't really a tune, but from the first note, the beast's eyes began to droop. Harry hardly drew breath. Slowly, the dog's growl ceased. It tottered on its paws and fell to its knees. Then it slumped to the ground, fast asleep. Keep playing, Ron warned Harry as they slipped out of the cloak and crept towards the trap door. They could feel the dog's hot, smelly breath as they approached the giant heads. I think we'll be able to pull the door open, said Ron, peering over the dog's back. Want to go first, Hermione? No, I don't. All right, Ron gritted his teeth and stepped carefully over the dog's legs. He bent and pulled the ring of the trap door, which swung up and open. What can you see, Hermione said anxiously. Nothing. Jet black. There's no way of climbing down. We'll just have to drop. Harry, who was still playing the flute, waved at Ron to get his attention and pointed at himself. You want to go first? Are you sure, said Ron. I don't know how deep this thing goes. Give the flute to Hermione so she can keep him asleep. Harry handed the flute over. In the few seconds silence, the dog growled and twitched. But the moment Hermione began to play, it fell back into its deep sleep. Harry climbed over it and looked down through the trap door. There was no sign of the bottom. He lowered himself through the hole until he was hanging on by his fingertips. Then he looked up at Ron and said, if anything happens to me, don't follow. Go straight to the Owlry and send Hagwood to Dumbledore, right? Right, said Ron. See you in a minute, I hope. And Harry let go. Cold, damp air rushed past him as he fell down, down, and flump. With a funny, muffled sort of thump, he landed on something soft. He sat up and felt around his eyes not used to the gloom. It felt as though he was sitting on some sort of plant. It's okay, he called up to the light the size of a posted stamp, which was the open trap door. It's a soft landing. You can jump. Ron followed straight away. He landed sprawled next to Harry. What's this stuff, were his first words. Dunno, sort of a plant thing. I suppose it's here to break the fall. Come on, Hermione. The distant music stopped. There was a loud bark from the dog, but Hermione had already jumped. She landed on Harry's other side. He must be, mi we must be miles under the school, she said. Lucky this plant things here, really, said Ron. Lucky, shrieked Hermione. Look at you both. She leapt up and struggled towards a damp wall. She had to struggle because the moment she had landed, the plan had started to twist snake-like tendrils around her ankles. As for Harry and Ron, their legs had already been bound tightly in long creepers without their noticing. Hermione had managed to free herself before the plant got a firm grip on her. Now she watched in horror as the two boys fought to pull the plant off them, but the more they strained against it, the tighter and faster the plant wound around them. Stop moving, Hermione ordered them. I know what this is. It's Devil's Snare. Oh, I'm so glad we know what it's called. That's a great help, snarled Ron, leaning back trying to stop the plant curling around his neck. Shut up. I'm trying to remember how to kill it, said Hermione. Well, hurry up. I can't breathe. Harry gasped, wrestling with it as it curled around his chest. Devil's snare. 
devil snare. What did Professor Sprout say? It's like the dark and the damp. So light a fire, Harry choked. Yes, of course, but there's no wood, Hermione cried, wringing her hands. Have you gone mad? Ron bellowed. Are you a witch or not? Oh, right, said Hermione, and she whipped out her wand and waved it, muttered something, and sent a jet of the same blue bell flames that she had used on Snape the plant. In a matter of seconds, the two boys felt it loosening at its grip as it cringed away from the light and warmth. Wriggling and flailing, and unraveled itself from the bodies, and they were able to pull free. Lucky you pay attention to herbology, Hermione, said Harry as he joined her by the wall, wiping sweat off his face. Yes, yeah, said Ron, and lucky Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. There's no wood, honestly. This way, said Harry, pointing down a stone passageway, which was the only way on. All they could hear a, a all they could hear apart from their footsteps was the gentle drip of water trickling down the walls. The passageway sloped downwards, and Harry was reminded of Gringotts. With an unpleasant jolt of the heart, he remembered the dragon said to be guarding vaults in the wizard's bank. If they met a dragon, a fully grown dragon, Norbert had been bad enough. Can you hear something? Ron whispered. Harry listened. A soft rustling clinking seemed to be coming from up ahead. Do you think it's a ghost? I don't know. Sounds like wings to me. There's light ahead. I can see something moving. They reached the end of the passageway and saw before them a brilliantly lit chamber, its ceiling arching high above them. It was full of small jewel bright birds, fluttering and tumbling all around the room. On the opposite side of the chamber was a heavy wooden door. Do you think they'll attack if we cross the room, said Ron? Probably, said Harry. They don't look very vicious, but I suppose if they all swoop down at once, well, there's nothing for it. I'll run. He took a deep breath, covered his face with his arms, and sprinted across the room. Hang on one second, Cass. I gotta plug in the laptop. He expected to feel sharp beaks and claws tear tearing at him any second, but nothing happened. He reached the door untouched. He pulled the handle, but it was locked. The other two followed him. They tugged and heaved at the door, but it wouldn't budge. Not even when Hermione tried her Alohomora charm. Now what, said Ron. These birds, they can't be here just for decoration, said Hermione. They watched the birds soaring overhead, glittering. Glittering? They're not birds, Harry said suddenly. They're keys, winged keys. Looked carefully, so that must mean he looked around the chamber while the other two squinted up the flock of keys. Yes, look, broomsticks, we've got to catch the key to the door. But there are hundreds of them, Ron ex examined the lock on the door. We're looking for a big old fashioned one, probably silver like the handle. They seized the broomstick each and kicked off into the air, soaring into the midst of the cloud of keys. They grabbed and snatched, but the bewitched keys darted and died so quickly it was almost impossible to catch one. Not for nothing though was Harry the youngest seeker in a century. He had a knack for spotting things other people didn't. After a minute's weaving around through a whirl of rainbow feathers, he noticed a large silver key that had a bent wing, as if it had already been caught and stuffed roughly into the keyhole. That one, he called to the others, that big one there, no there, with bright blue wings, the feathers are crumbled on one side. Ron went speeding in the direction that Harry was pointing, crashed into the ceiling, and nearly fell off his broom. We've got to close it in, Harry called, not taking his eyes off the key with the damaged wing. Ron, you come at it from above. Hermione, stay below and stop it going down, and I'll try to catch it right now. Ron dived. Hermione rocketed upwards. The key dodged them both, and Harry streaked after it. It sped towards the wall. Harry leaned forward and, with a nasty crunching noise, pinned it against the stone with one hand. Ron and Hermione's cheers echoed around the high chamber. They landed quickly and Harry ran to the door, the key struggling in his hand. He rammed it into the lock and turned. It worked. The moment the lock had clicked open, the key took flight again, looking very battered now that it had been caught twice. Ready? Harry asked the other two, his hand on the door handle. They nodded. He pulled the door open. 
The next chamber was so dark they couldn't see anything at all. But as they stepped into it, light suddenly flooded the room to reveal an astonishing sight. They were standing on the edge of a huge chessboard. Behind the black chessmen, which were all taller than they were and carved from what looked like black stone. Facing them, way across the chamber, were the white pieces. Harry, Ron, and Hermione shivered slightly. The towering white chessmen had no faces. Now what do we do? Harry whispered. It's obvious, isn't it? said Ron. We've got to play our way across the room. Behind the white pieces, they could see another door. How? said Hermione nervously. I think, said Ron, we're going to have to be chessmen. He walked up to a black knight and put his hand out to touch the knight's horse. At once, the stone sprang to life. The horse pawned the ground, and the knight turned his helmeted head to look down at Ron. Do we, er, have to join you to get across? The black knight nodded. Ron turned to the other two. This one's thinking about, he said. I suppose we've got to take the place of three of the black pieces. Harry and, and Hermione stayed quiet, watching Ron think. Finally, he said, no, don't be offended of, or anything, but neither you are, are that good at chess. We're not offended, said Harry quickly. Just tell us what to do. Well, Harry, you take the place of that bishop, and Hermione, you go there instead of that castle. What about you? I'm going to be a knight, said Ron. The chessmen seemed to have been listening because at these words, a knight, a bishop, and a castle turned their backs on the white pieces and walked off the board, leaving three empty squares, which Harry, Ron, and Hermione took. White always plays first in chess, said Ron, peering across the board. Yes, look. A white pawn had moved forward two squares. Ron started to direct the black pieces. They moved silently wherever he sent them. Harry's knees were trembling. What if they lost? Harry moved diagonally four squares to the right. The first real shock came when their other knight was taken. The white queen smashed him to the floor and dragged him off the board, where he lay quite still face down. <clears throat> Had to let that happen, said Ron, looking shaken. Leaves you free to take that bishop, Hermione. Go on. Every time one of their men was lost, the white pieces showed no mercy. Soon, there was a huddle of limp black players slumped along the wall. Twice, Ron only just noticed in time that Harry and Hermione were in danger. He himself darted around the board, taking almost as many white pieces as they had lost black ones. We're nearly there, he muttered suddenly. Let me think. Let me think. The white queen turned her blank face towards him. Yes, said Ron softly. It's the only way. I've got to be taken. No, Harry and Hermione shouted. That's chess, snapped Ron. You've got to make some sacrifices. I'll make my move and she'll take me. That leaves you free to checkmate the king, Harry. But do you want to stop Snape or not? Ron, look, if you don't hurry up, he'll already have the stone. There was nothing else for it. Ready? Ron called, his face pale but determined. Here I go now. Don't hang around once you've won. He stepped forward and the white queen pounced. She struck Ron hard around the head with her stone arm and he crashed to the floor. Hermione screamed but stayed on her square. The white queen dragged Ron to one side. He looked as if he'd been knocked out. Shaking Harry moved, shaking, Harry moved three spaces to the left. The white king took off his crown and threw it at Harry's feet. They had won. The chessmen parted and bowed, leaving the door ahead clear. With one last desperate look back at Ron, Harry and Hermione charged through the door and up the next passageway. What if he's, he'll be all right, said Harry, trying to convince himself. What do you reckon's next? We've had sprouts. That was the devil's snare. Flitwick must have put the charms on the keys. McGonagall transfigured the chessmen to make them alive. At least quarrel spell and snakes. They had reached another door. All right, Harry whispered, go on. Harry pushed it open. A disgusting smell filled their nostrils, making both of them put their robes up to their noses. Eyes watering, they saw flat on the floor in front of them, a troll even larger than the one they had tackled, out cold with a bloody lump on its head. I'm glad we didn't have to fight that one, Harry whispered, as they stepped carefully over one of its massive legs. 
Come on, I can't breathe. He pulled open the next door, both of them hardly daring to look at what came next. But there was nothing very frightening in here, just a table with seven differently shaped bottles standing on, on it in a line. Snape, said Harry, what do we have to do? They stepped over the threshold and immediately a fire sprang up behind them in the doorway. It wasn't ordinary fire either, it was purple. At the same instant, black flames shot up in the doorway leading onwards. They were trapped. Look, Hermione seized a roll of paper lying next to the bottles. Harry looked over her shoulder to read it. Danger lies before you, while safely, safety lies behind. Two of us will help you, whichever you would find. One among us seven will let you move ahead. Another will transport the drinker back instead. Two among our number hold only nettle wine. Three of us are killers waiting hidden in line. Choose unless you wish to stay here forevermore. To help you in your choice, we give you these clues for. First, however slyly the potion tries to hide, you will always find someone nettle wine's left side. Second, different are those who stand at either end. But if you would move onwards, neither is your friend. Third, as you cl see clearly, all are different size. Neither dwarf nor giant holds deaf in their insides. Fourth, the second left and the second on the right are twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Hermione let out a great sigh, and Harry, amazed, saw that she was smiling, the very last thing he felt like doing. Brilliant, said Hermione. This isn't magic. It's logic. A puzzle. A lot of the greatest wizards haven't gotten out to logic. They'd be stuck in here forever. But so will we, won't we? Of course not, said Hermione. Everything we need is here on this paper. Seven bottles, three are poison, two are wine, one will get us safely through the black fire, and one will get us back through the purple. But how do we know which to drink? Give me a minute. Hermione read the paper several times. Then she walked up and down the line of bottles, muttering to herself and pointing at them. At last she clapped her hands. Got it, she said. The smallest bottle will get us through the black fire towards the stone. Harry looked at the tiny bottle. There's only enough there for one of us, he said. That's hardly one swallow. They looked at each other. Which one will get you back through the purple flames? Hermione pointed at a rounded bottle at the end of the line. You drink that, said Harry. No, listen, get back and get Ron. Grab brooms from the flying key room. They'll get you out of the trap door and pass Fluffy. Go straight to the owlery and send Hedwig to Dumbledore. We need him. I might be able to hold Snape off for a while, but I'm no match for him, really. But Harry, what if you know who's with him? Well, I was lucky once, wasn't I? Said Harry, pointing at his scar. I might get lucky again. Hermione's lip trembled, and she suddenly dashed at Harry and threw her arms around him. Hermione, Harry, you're a great wizard, you know. I'm not as good as you, said Harry, very embarrassed as she let go of him. Me, said Hermione books and cleverness. There are more important things, friendship and bravery, and, oh, Harry, be careful. You drink first, said Harry. You are sure which is which, aren't you? Positive, said Hermione. She took a long drink from the round bottle at the end and shuddered. It's not poison, said Harry anxiously. No, but it's like ice. Quick, go before it wears off. Good luck, take care, go. Hermione turned and walked straight through the purple fire. Harry took a deep breath and picked up the smallest bottle. He turned to face the black flames. Here I come, he said, and he drank, drained the little bottle in one gulp. It was indeed as though ice was flooding through his body. He put the bottle down and walked forward. He braced himself, saw the black flames licking his body, and couldn't feel them. For a moment, he couldn't see nothing but dark fire. Then he was on the other side in the last chamber. There was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. All right, we're gonna move on to the last chapter. Any guesses? It's not Snape and it's not Voldemort. Who is it? Um, so, well, it probably isn't anybody who brung Harry to the Weasleys in the first place, right? It wouldn't be someone who what? Who brung who brought Harry to the Weasleys 
in the first place. Like, not Professor McGonagall. Not Professor McGonagall? Yeah. Well, it's not Professor McGonagall. Do you have, you know, it's not her. Do you, is it some, and someone else? Um, is it the man that was helping the, was it help? Was it the man who was helping Snape? Quirrell? Yeah. It's Professor Quirrell. Here we go. The final chapter, 17. The man with two faces. It was Quirrell. You, gasped Harry. Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. I thought Snape. Severus, Quirrell laughed, and it wasn't usu his usual quivering tremble either, but cold and sharp. Yes, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, you would suspect p p p poor st st stuttering p p Professor Quirrell. Harry couldn't take it in. This couldn't be true. It couldn't. But Snape tried to kill me. No, no, no. I tried to kill you. Your friend, Miss Granger, accidentally knocked the, me over as she rushed to set fire to Snape at the Quidditch match. She broke my eye contact with you. Another few seconds, and I'd have got you off that broom. I'd have managed it before then if Snape hadn't been muttering a counter curse trying to save you. Snape was trying to save me? Of course, said Quirrell coolly. Why do you think he wanted to referee our next match? He was trying to make sure I didn't do it again. Funny, really. You needn't have bothered. I couldn't do anything with Dumbledore watching. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor winning. He did make himself unpopular. And what a waste of time when after all that, I'm going to kill you tonight. Quirrell snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry. You're too nosy to live, Potter. Scurrying around the school at, at Halloween like that, for all I knew, you'd seen me coming to look at what was guarding the stone. You let the troll in. Certainly. I have a special gift with trolls. You must have seen what I did to the one in the chamber back there. Unfortunately, while everyone else was running around looking for it, Snape, who already suspected me, went straight to the third floor to head me off. And not only did my troll fail to beat you to death, that free-headed dog didn't even manage to bite Snape's leg off properly. Now wait quietly, Potter. I need to examine this interesting mirror. It was only then that Harry realized what was standing behind Quirrell. It was the mirror of her eyes. This mirror is the key to finding the stone, Quirrell murmured, trapping his way around the frame. Trust Dumbledore to come up with something like this but he's in London. I'll be far away by the time he gets back. All Harry could think of doing was to keep Quirrell talking and stop him concentrating on the mirror. I saw you and Snape in the forest, he blurted out. Yes, said Quirrell idly, walking around the mirror to look at the back. He was on to me by that time, trying to find out how far I'd got. He suspected me all along, tried to frighten me as though he could when I had Lord Voldemort on my side. Quirrell came back out from behind the mirror and stared hungrily into it. I see the stone. I'm presenting it to my master. But where is it? Harry struggled against the ropes binding him, but they didn't give. He had to keep Quirrell from giving his whole attention to the mirror. But Snape always seemed to hate me so much. Oh, he does, said Quirrell casually. Heavens, yes. He was at Hogwarts with your father, didn't you know? They loathed each other but he never wanted you dead. But I heard you a few days ago sobbing. I thought Snape was threatening you. For the first time, a spasm of fear flitted across Quirrell's face. Sometimes, he said, I find it hard to follow my master's instructions. He's a great wizard and I am weak. You mean he was there in the classroom with you? Harry gasped. He is with me wherever I go, said Quirrell quietly. I met him when I traveled around the world. A foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. 
Lord Voldemort showed me what wrong, how wrong I was. There's no good and evil. There's only power, and those too weak to see it. Since then, I have served him faithfully. Although I have let him down many times, he has had to be very hard on me, Quirrell shivered suddenly. He does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was most displeased. He punished me, decided he would have to keep a closer watch on me. Quirrell's voice tailed away. Harry was remembering his trip to Diagon Alley. How could he have been so stupid? He'd seen Quirrell there that very day, shaken hands with him in the leaky cauldron. Quirrell cursed under his breath. I don't understand. Is the stone inside the mirror? Should I break it? Harry's mind was racing. What I want more than anything else in the world at the moment, he thought, is to find the stone before Quirrell does. So if I look in the mirror, I should see myself finding it, which means I'll see where it's hidden. But how can I look without Quirrell realizing what I'm up to? He tried to edge to the left to get in front of the glass without Quirrell noticing, but the ropes around his ankles were too tight. He tripped and fell over. Quirrell ignored him. He was still talking to himself. What does this mirror do? How does it work? Help me, master. And to Harry's horror, a voice answered. And the voice seemed to come from Quirrell himself. Use the boy. Use the boy. Quirrell rounded on Harry. Yes, Potter, come here. He clapped his hands once and the ropes binding Harry fell off. Harry got slowly to his feet. Come here, Quirrell repeated. Look in the mirror and tell me what you see. Harry walked towards him. I must lie, he thought desperately. I must look and lie about what I see, that's all. Quirrell moved close behind him. Harry breathed in the funny smell that seemed to come from Quirrell's turban. He closed his eyes, stepped in front of the mirror, and opened them again. He saw his reflection, pale and scared looking at first. But a moment later, the reflection smiled at him. It put its hand into its pocket and pulled out a blood red stone. It winked and put the stone back in its pocket. And as it did so, Harry felt something heavy drop into his pocket. Somehow, incredibly, he'd got the stone. Well, said Quirrell impatiently, what do you see? Harry screwed up his courage. I see myself shaking hands with Dumbledore, he invented. I I've won the house cup for Gryffindor. Quirrell cursed again. Get out of the way, he said. As Harry moved aside, he felt the sorcerer's stone against his leg. Dare he make a break for it? But he hadn't walked five paces before a voice high voice spoke, though Quirrell wasn't moving his lips. He lies. He lies. Potter, come back here, Quirrell shouted. Tell me the truth. What did you just see? The voice spoke again. Let me speak to him face to face. Master, you're not strong enough. I have strength enough for this. Harry felt as if Devil's Snare were rooting him to the spot. He couldn't move a muscle. Petrified, he watched as Quirrell reached up and began to unwrap his turban. But was what was going on? The turban fell away. Quirrell's head looked strangely small without it. Then he turned slowly on the spot. Harry would have screamed, but he couldn't make a sound. Where there should have been a, a back to Quirrell's head, there was a face the most terrible face Harry had ever seen. It was chalk white with glaring red eyes and slits for nostrils, like a snake. Harry Potter, it whispered. Harry tried to take a step backwards, but his legs wouldn't move. See what I have become, the face said, mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body, but there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me these past weeks. You saw faithful Quirrell drink, drinking it for me in the forest. And once I have the elixir of life, I'll be able to create a body of my own. Now, why don't you give me that stone in your pocket? So he knew. The feeling suddenly surged back into Harry's legs. He stumbled backwards. Don't be a fool, snarled the face. Better save your own life and join me, or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. 
liar, Harry shouted suddenly. Quirrell was walking backwards at him so that Voldemort could still see him, the evil face now smiling. How touching, it hissed. I always value bravery. Yes, boy, your parents were brave. I killed your father first and he put up a courageous fight, but your mother needn't have died. She was trying to protect you. Now give me the stone unless you want to have her died in vain. Never. Harry sprang towards the flame door, but Voldemort screamed, seize him. And next second, Harry felt Quirrell's hand close on his wrist. At once, a needle sharp pain seared across Harry's scar. His head felt as though it was about to split in two. He yelled, struggling with all his might, and to his surprise, Quirrell let go of him. The pain in his head lessened. He looked around wildly to see where Quirrell had gone. Yes, honey. Who is that inside the, like, scarf thingy? That's Voldemort. Mm. It's, it's the back of Quirrell's head. Voldemort's soul is there. Oh, so that's why the chapter was like that. He has, um, he has, um, yeah, he has faces. Quirrell's control and, like, he, he just covers it, the back of his head because, um, to hide him. Yeah, and yeah. I think I know why. Um, whenever Voldemort gets near Harry, his scar hurts because it's like a sign. It's like a sign of warning. You're right. He saw him hunched in pain, looking at his fingers. They were blistering before his eyes. Seize him, seize him, shrieked Voldemort again, and Quirrell lunged, knocking Harry clean off his feet, landing on top of him, both hands around Harry's neck. Harry's scar was almost blinding him with pain, yet he could see Quirrell howling in agony. Master, I cannot hold him. My hands, my hands. And Quirrell, though pinning Harry to the ground with his knees, let go of his neck and stared bewildered at his own palms. Harry could see they looked burnt, raw, red, and shiny. Then kill him, fool, and be done, screeched Voldemort. Quirrell raised his hand to perform a deadly curse, but Harry, by instinct, reached up and grabbed Quirrell's face. Ah! Quirrell rolled off him, his face blistering too, and then Harry knew. Quirrell couldn't touch his bare skin, not without suffering terrible pain. His only chance was to keep hold of Quirrell, keep him in enough pain to stop him doing a curse. Harry jumped to his feet, caught Quirrell by the arm, and hung on as tight as he could. Quirrell screamed and tried to throw Harry off. The pain in Harry's head was building. He couldn't see. He could only hear Quirrell's terrible shrieks and Voldemort yells of kill him, kill him, and other voices, maybe in Harry's own head, crying, Harry, Harry. He felt Quirrell's arm wrench from his grasp knew all was lost and fell into blackness, down, down, down. Something gold was glinting just above him, the snitch. He tried to catch it, but his arms were too heavy. He blinked. It wasn't the snitch at all. It was a pair of glasses. How strange. He blinked again. The smiling face of Albert Dumbledore swam into view above him. Good afternoon, Harry, said Dumbledore. Harry stared at him. Then he remembered. Sir, the stone. It was Quirrell. He's got the stone. Sir, quick. Calm yourself, dear boy. You are a little behind the time, said Dumbledore. Quirrell does not have the stone. Then who does, sir? I... Harry, please relax, or Madame Pomfrey will have me thrown out. Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital right wing. He was lying in bed. <clears throat> with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the sweet shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore beaming. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is a complete secret, so naturally the whole school knows. I believe your friends, Mr. Fred and George Weasley, were responsible for trying to send you a laboratory seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you. Madame Pomfrey, however, 
thought it might not be very hygienic and confiscated it. How long have I been in here? Three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley and Miss Granger will be most relieved you have come round. They have been extremely worried. But sir, the stone. I see you are not to be distracted. Very well, the stone. Professor Quirrell did not manage to take it from you. I arrived in time to prevent that. Although you were doing very well on your own, I might say. You got there? You got Hermione's owl? You must have crossed in midair. No sooner had I reached London than it became clear to me that the place I should be was the one I had just left. I arrived just in time to pull Quirrell off. It was you. I feared I might be too late. You nearly wore. I couldn't have him hold him. I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. Not the stone, boy. You. The effort involved nearly killed you. For one terrible moment there, I was afraid it had. As for the stone, it has been destroyed. Destroyed, said Harry blankly. But your friend, Nicholas Flamel. Oh, you know about Nicholas, said Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? Well, Nicholas and I have a, had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. But that means he and his wife will die, won't they? They have enough elixir stored to set up their affairs in order. And then, yes, they will die. Dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on Harry's face. To one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas and Purnell, it really is looking, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. You know, the stone was really not such a wonderful thing. As much money in life as you could want. The two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things which are worse for them. Harry lay there lost for words. Dumbledore hummed a little and smiled at the ceiling. Sir, said Harry, I've got thinking, I've been thinking, sir, even if the stone's gone, vault, I mean, you know who. Call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for things. Fear of a name increases fear of the thing itself. Yes, sir. Well, Voldemort's going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he hasn't gone, has he? Harry, he has not. He is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quirrell to die. He shows just as little mercy to his followers as his enemies. Nevertheless, Harry, while you may only have delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who's prepared to fight what seems a losing battle next time. And if he is delayed again and again, why, he may never return to power. Harry nodded, but stopped quickly, because it made his head hurt. Then he said, Sir, there are some other things I'd like to know, if you can tell me, things I want to know the truth about. The truth, Dumbledore sighed. It is a beautiful and terrible thing, and should therefore be treated with great caution. However, I shall answer your questions unless I have a very good reason not to, in which case, I beg you'll forgive me. I shall not, of course, lie. Well... Voldemort said that he only killed my mother because she tried to stop him from killing me. But why would he want to kill me in the first place? Dumbledore sighed very deeply this time. Alas, the first thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. Not today, not now. You will know one day. Put it in your mind for now, Harry. When you are older, I know you hate to hear this. When you are ready, you will know. And Harry knew it would be no good to argue. But why couldn't Quirrell touch me? Your mother died to save you. If there's one thing Voldemort cannot stand, it is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. Not a scar, no visible sign to have been loved so deeply. Even though the person you love, who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. 
Dumbledore now became very interested in a bird out of the windowsill, which gave Harry time to dry his eyes on the sheet. When he had found his voice again, Harry said, in the invisibility cloak, do you know who sent it to me? Ah, uh, your father happened to leave it in my possession, and I thought you might like it. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. Useful things. Your father used it mainly for sneaking off to the kitchens to steal food when he was here. And there's something else. Fire away. Quirrell said Snape. His father, Snape, Harry. Yes, him, Quirrell said. He hates me because he hated my father. Is that true? Well, they didn't rather detest each other, not unlike yourself and Mr. Malfoy. And then your father did something Snape could not forgive. What? He saved his life. What? Yes, said Dumbledore dreamily. Funny the way people's minds work, isn't it? Professor Snape couldn't bear being in your father's debt. I do believe he worked so hard to protect you this year because he felt that it would make him and your father quits. Then he could go back to hating your father's memory in peace. Harry tried to understand this, but it made his head pound, so he stopped. And so, here's one more thing. Just, how did I get the stone out of the mirror? Ah, now I'm glad you asked me that. It was one of my more brilliant ideas, and between you and me, that's saying something. You see, only one who wanted to find the stone, find it, but not use it, would be able to get it. Otherwise, they just see themselves making gold or drinking elixir of life. My brain surprises even me sometimes. Now enough questions. I suggest you make a start on those sweets. Ah, Bertie bots every flavor beans. I was unfortunate enough in my youth to come across a vomit flavored one. And since then, I'm afraid I've lost my liking for them. But I think I'll be safe with a nice toffee, don't you? He smiled and popped the golden brown bean into his mouth. Then he choked and said, alas, earwax. <laughs> Madame Pomfrey, the matron, was a nice woman, very strict. Just five minutes, Harry pleaded. Absolutely not. You let Professor Dumbledore in? Well, of course, that was the headmaster. Quite different. You need rest. I am resting. Look, lying down and everything. Oh, go on, Madame Pomfrey. Oh, very well, she said, but five minutes only. And she let Ron and Hermione in. Harry! Hermione looked ready to fling her arms around him again. But Harry was glad she let herself in as his head was still very sore. Oh, Harry, we were sure you were going to. Dumbledore was so worried. The whole school's talking about it, said Ron. What really happened? It was one of those rare occasions when the true story is even more strange and exciting than the wild rumors. Harry told them everything. Quirrell, the mirror, the stone, and Voldemort. Ron and Hermione were a very good audience. They gasped in all the right places, and when Harry told them that what was under Quirrell's turban, Hermione screamed out loud. So, so the stone's gone, said Ron finally. Flamel's just going to die? That's what I said, but Dumbledore thinks that, what was it? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure? I always said he was off his rocker, said Ron, looking quite impressed at how mad his hero was. So what happened to you two? said Harry. Well, I got back all right, said Hermione. I brought Ron round, that took a while, and we were dashing up to the Owlry to contact Dumbledore when we met him in the entrance hall. He already knew, he just said, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he? And hurried off to the third floor. Do you think he meant you to do it? Said Ron, sending you your father's cloak and everything. Well, Hermione exploded. If he did, I mean to say, that's terrible. You could have been killed. No, it isn't, said Harry thoughtfully. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know? I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try. And instead of stopping us, he just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to see face Voldemort if I could. Yeah, Dumbledore's barking all right, said Ron proudly. Listen, you've got to go for the end of year feast tomorrow. The points are all in and Slytherin won, of course. You missed the last Quidditch match. We were steamrolled by Ravenclaw without you, but the food will be good. At that moment, Madame Pomfrey bustled over. You've had nearly 15 minutes now. Out, she said firmly. 
After a good night's sleep, Harry felt nearly back to normal. I want to go to the feast, he told Madame Pomfrey as she straightened his many sweet boxes. I can, can't I? Professor Dumbledore says you are to be allowed to go, she said sniffily, as though in her opinion, Professor Dumbledore didn't realize how risky feasts could be. And you have another visitor. Oh, good, said Harry. Who is it? Hagrid sidled through the door as he spoke. As usual, when he was indoors, Hagrid looked too big to be allowed. He sat down next to Harry, took one look at him, and burst into tears. It's all my ruddy fault, he sobbed, his face in his hand. I told the evil get how to get past Fluffy. I told him. It was the only thing he didn't know, and I told him. He could have died. All for a dragon egg. I've never drank again. I should be chucked out and to made to live as a muggle. Hagrid, said Harry, shocked to see Hagrid shaking with grief and remorse. Great tears leaking down into his beard. Hagrid, he'd have found out somehow. This is Voldemort we're talking about. He'd have found out even if you hadn't told him. You could have died, sobbed Hagrid, and don't say the name. Voldemort, Harry bellowed, and Hagrid was so shocked he stopped crying. I've met him and I'm calling him by his name. Please cheer up, Hagrid. We saved the stone. It's gone. He can't use it. Have a chocolate frog. I've got loads. Hagrid wiped his nose on the back of his hand and said, That reminds me. I've got you a present. It's not a stout sandwich, is it? said Harry anxiously. At last, Hagrid gave a weak chuckle. Nah, Dumbledore gave me the day off yesterday to fix it. Of course, he should have sacked me instead. Anyway, I got you this. It seemed to be a handsome leather-covered book. Harry opened it curiously. It was full of wizard photos. Smiling and waving at him from every page were his mother and father. Sent owls off to all your parents' old fr school friends asking for photos. Nee didn't have any. Do you like it? Harry couldn't speak, but Hagrid understood. Harry made his way down to the end of year feast alone that night. He had been held up by Madame Pomfrey's fussing about insisting on giving him one last checkup. So the great hall was already full. It was decked out in the Slytherin colors of green and silver to celebrate Slytherins winning the House Cup for the seventh year in a row. A huge banner showing the Slytherin serpent covered the wall behind the high table. When Harry walked in, there was a sudden hush, and then everybody started talking loudly at once. He slipped into a seat between Ron and Hermione at the Gryffindor table and tried to ignore the fact that people were standing up to look at him. Fortunately, Dumbledore arrived moments later. The babble died away. Another year gone, Dumbledore said cheerfully, and I must trouble you with an old man's wheezing waffle before we sink our teeth into our delicious feast. What a year it has been. Hopefully your heads are all a little fuller than they were. You have the whole summer ahead to get them nice and empty before next year starts. Now, as I understand it, the house cup here needs a wording and the points stand thus. In fourth place, Gryffindor with 312 points. In third, Hufflepuff with 352. Ravenclaw have 426 and Slytherin 472. A storm of cheering and stamping broke out from the Slytherin table. Harry could see Draco Malfoy banging his goblet on the table. It was a sickening sight. Yes, yes, well done Slytherin, said Dumbledore. However, recent events must be taken into account. The room went very still. The Slytherin smiles faded a little. Ahem, <clears throat> said Dumbledore. I have a few last minute points to dish out. Let me see. Yes. First, to Mr. Ronald Weasley. Ron went purple in the face. He looked like a radish with bad sunburn. For the best played game of chess, Hogwarts has seen in many years. I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Gryffindor cheers daily raised the bewitched ceiling. The stars overhead seemed to quiver. Percy could be heard telling the other prefix, my brother, you know, my youngest brother, got past McGonagall's giant chess set. At last, there was silence again. Second, to Miss Hermione Granger, for the use of cool logic in the face of fire, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Hermione buried her face in her arms. Harry strongly suspected she had burst into tears. Gryffindors up and down the table were besides themselves. They were up a hundred points. Third, to Mr. Harry Potter, said Dumbledore. The room went deadly quiet. 
for pure nerve and outstanding courage, I award Gryffindor House 60 points. The din was defeating. Those who could add up while yelling themselves hoarse knew that Gryffindor now had 472 points, exactly the same as Slytherin. They had drawn for the House Cup. If only Dumbledore had given Harry just one more. Dumbledore raised his hand. The room gradually fell silent. There are all kinds of courage, said Dumbledore, smiling. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I therefore award 10 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. Someone standing outside the Great Hall might well have thought some sort of explosion had taken place. So loud was the noise that erupted from the Gryffindor table. Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood up to yell and cheer as Neville, white with shock, disappeared under a pile of people hugging him. He had never won so much as a point for Gryffindor before. Harry, still cheering, nudged Ron in the ribs and pointed at Malfoy, who couldn't have looked more stunned and horrified if he had just had the bloody bind, body bind curse put on him. Which means, Dumbledore called over the storm of applause, for even Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were celebrating the downfall fall of Slytherin. We need a little change of decoration. He clapped his hands in an instant. The green hangings became scarlet and the silver became gold. The huge Slytherin serpent vanished and a towering Gryffindor lion took place. Snape was shaking Professor McGonagall's hand with a horrible forced smile. He caught Harry's eye, and Harry knew at once that Snape's feelings toward him hadn't changed one jot. This didn't worry Harry. It seemed as though life would be back to normal next year, or as normal as it ever gets at Hogwarts. It was the best evening of Harry's life. Better than winning at Quidditch or Christmas or walking out mountain trolls, he would never forget tonight. Celebrate good times. Harry had almost forgotten that the exam results were still to come, but come they did. To their great surprise, both he and Ron passed with good marks. Hermione, of course, came top of the year. Even Neville scraped through, his good herbology mark making up for his abysmal potions one. They had hoped that Goyle, who was almost as stupid as he was mean, might be thrown out, but he had passed too. It was a shame. But as Ron said, you couldn't have everything in life. He has the black keys, not the white keys. And suddenly, their wardrobes were empty. Their trunks were packed. Neville's toad was found lurking in a corner of the toilets. Notes were handed out to all the students, warning them not to use magic over the holidays. I always hope they'll forget to give us these, said Fred Weasley sadly. Hagrid was there to take them down to the fleet of boats that sailed across the lake. They were boarding the Hogwarts Express talking and laughing as the countryside became greener and tidier. Eating Bertie Bott's every flavor beans as they sped past muggle towns, pulling off their wizard robes and pulling on jackets and coats, pulling into platform nine and three quarters at King's Cross Station. It took quite a while for them all to get off the platform. A wise old guard was up by the ticket barrier, letting them go through the gates in twos and threes so they didn't attract attention by all bursting out of a solid wall at once and alarming the muggles. You must come and stay this summer, said Ron. Both of you, I'll send you an owl. Thanks, said Harry. I'll need something to look forward to. People jostled them as they moved forwards towards the gateway back to the muggle world. Some of them called, bye Harry, see you Potter. Still famous, said Ron, grinning at him. Not where I'm going, I promise you, said Harry. He, Ron, and Hermione passed through the gateway together. There he is, Mom, there he is, look. It was Jenny Weasley, Ron's younger sister, but she was pointing at Ron. Harry Potter, she squealed. Look, Mom, I can see. Be quiet, Jenny, it's rude to point. Mrs. Weasley smiled down at them. Busy year, she said. Very, said Harry. Thanks for the fudge and the jumper, Mrs. Weasley. Oh, it was nothing, dear. Ready, are you? It was Uncle Vernon, still purple face, still mustached, still looking furious at the nerve of Harry, carrying an owl in a cage in a station full of ordinary people. Behind him stood Aunt Petunia and Dudley, looking terrified at the very sight of Harry. You must be Harry's family, said Mrs. Weasley. In a manner of speaking, said Uncle Vernon. Hurry up, boy, we haven't got all day, he walked away. Harry hung back for a last word with Ron and Hermione. 
See you over the summer then. Hope you have a, er, a good holiday, said Hermione, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon, shocked that anyone could be so unpleasant. Oh, I will, said Harry, and they were surprised at the grin that was spreading over his face. They don't know we're not allowed to use magic at home. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this summer. And that is the end of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Why do you th I kind of don't understand. I think I know why Dud that I think I know why Harry's going to have some fun with um Dudley. Um I kind of think that um that since he's like since Dudley's more scared now, um you know, it'll be way more fun for Harry than um and plus um Rem I think I remember um, re reading a little bit of the beginning of the book, and like I and remember whenever the um, birthday of Dudley started, and like and they accidentally said Duddy instead Dudley. That's a goof. <laughs> All right, Miss Cass, thank you for coming to every single Harry Potter read aloud and joining me in this journey. And since you're coming back next year, we'll be reading probably Chamber of Secrets. Keep that in mind. And are you going to watch the movie tonight? Yeah. All right, let me know how it is. I gotta go. I don't feel so good about this myself. All right. And Bye.